and turn with me, if you will, to the New Testament, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. We are reading today from the New King James Version, and our entire scripture lesson text can be found on the insert in your bulletin. We looked last week at the idea of walking with God in the newness of life. Our text today informs us that to continue this walk in newness, we need something that only God can provide. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, has taken us, even when we are dead in sins, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the age to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him, that we should walk in. Pray with me this morning as we examine this text with this thought in mind. Walking in grace. Walking in grace. Let's pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you once again for the privilege and opportunity of standing before these thy people. Lord, we pray now that the words of my mouth and that the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, Amen. About 20 years ago, my wife convinced me to go on our first ever cruise on the ocean. She had a hard time convincing me. I was working so many hours, but she finally convinced me. And I had the time of my life. The best sleep that I ever had was on that ship as it was rocking back and forth out on the Atlantic Ocean. And every kind of food that you could think of, and as much as you wanted, was available 24 hours a day. And I knew about the food because my friends and co-workers who had been on cruises told me that eating well was one of the great perks of going on a cruise. So I knew about it. I knew I expected the food. But I read a story a while back about a man who had saved up his money until he had enough to pay for the cruise of his dreams. He saved all he had. He had enough money, and he knew he had enough money for the cruise, but he didn't know that the food was provided in the price of the ticket. So he paid the ticket. And since he didn't know that he was going to get any food, and he had spent all this money to pay for the cruise, he made himself a big pile of peanut butter and jelly sandwich and stored them away in a bag to take with him so he could eat during the cruise. And that worked fine for most of the cruise until he saw all the delicious food that all the other people were eating, and he started to get a little tired of that peanut butter and jelly. So finally, he asked a man with a huge plate of delicious food, how much would it cost for just one little small plate of what he had? And the man looked at him strangely for a minute and finally told the peanut butter and jelly eater that all the delicious food that he had uh, on his plate was part of the price of the ticket. So all this food that you have passed up is already paid for when you paid for your ticket. The salvation of God is something like the food on the ocean cruise. It's already been paid for. Grace has covered the cost. You could not afford it if you had to pay for it, but it is yours by God's grace. So often people act as if they have to save up enough good works to present to God in order to earn his salvation. But they never get enough good works, so they don't come to receive from God the salvation that Jesus has already provided and paid for on the cross. Grace has provided free passage to everyone with faith. God's grace holds your reservation. Faith is your ticket. And one more thing that I remember from that cruise that I took. The waitstaff and the busboys let us know that although the food was free, they would not be offended by a little gratitude to those who had served it. So they sent gratitude boxes around to each table at dinner time. God's grace is free. You can't earn it. 
But God appreciates a little gratitude from those who claim to be his children. And the way that we live our lives shows our gratitude towards God. Since our salvation comes by God's grace alone, our walk should show our thankfulness to God. Our walk should show it. But the question is how? How can we demonstrate our thankfulness to God by just the way we live our life? Well, the answer is in the text. So let's turn to this text to discover how our walk can show our gratitude toward God. Looking at the text again, beginning at verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Since our salvation comes by God's grace alone, we should walk in faith so that God's grace will continue to flow in our lives. We should walk in faith so that God's grace can continue. God has already demonstrated his grace by giving you salvation. Now think about that. God grants you eternal life as an introduction to who he is. He says, if you can have enough faith to receive my offer of life, I have much more in store for you. But, the, but faith is the key. Faith is the key. It takes faith to step out with God, and it takes faith to stay with God. But it gets easier, because God confirms each step of faith that you take to encourage you to take that next step. He makes the walk easier by, by giving you, with each step of faith, the encouragement to take the next step. And when you learn how to consistently respond in faith and with faith, God will show you that salvation was not the end of his grace. It was just the beginning. It was just the beginning. So let's look back up and look at our text where we just went over to, to get an understanding of what this grace is like. In verse 1, it says that God made you alive when you were dead in sin. You were dead because you were walking according to the ways of the world and not of God. Verse 2 said that you were under the power of the spirit who controls those who walk in disobedience. You were doing Satan bidding, whether you knew it or not. Verse 3 says that we were all there at one time, fulfilling our own desires and living the way that seemed natural to us. The natural ways of man put him under the wrath of God because man's nature has been, has a bent towards evil ever since Adam and Eve. We all have a sin nature. And a lot of us feel that we aren't that bad. We, you know, we didn't kill anyone. We just did what human nature guided us to do. Well, if you just follow human nature, just do what human nature takes you to do, you will lie, you will cheat, you will steal, you will deceive, you will envy, and a host of other things that will bring you under the wrath of God just by doing the natural things. What comes that you to? But verse 4 says, but God, but God. Now, but God is what they call an arresting conjunction. It arrests everything that came before it and holds it hostage until God has his say. A whole lot of things are about to be changed when you see the words, but God. All of the evil that's stacked up before that phrase are about to be washed away with the words, but God. But God indicates, indicates that God is about to fix something. Hurt, harm, and danger may be heading your way, but God can stop them in their tracks. Sometimes you feel like you're at the end of your rope, but God gives you strength to go on. Look at what the psalmist said in Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God gives you strength to go on when you don't feel like you can go on. Sometimes folks, you do your wrong, but God is able to fix that. Look at what Joseph said to his brothers who had sold him as a slave in Egypt and then he ended up as the prime minister of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph said, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about, as it is to this day, to save many people alive. They thought that Joseph would hold a grudge now that he was in power, and Joseph said, You did what you did because you are who you are. But God had my back. God has a purpose even for the evil that you did. Now sometimes folks will plot evil against you, but God is able to keep them from hurting you. Like Jacob and his father-in-law Laban. Jacob worked for Laban for 20 years, and Laban kept changing Jacob's pay to try to cheat him out of what he owed him. And see, he paid Jacob in livestock. And so one year he said, well, you'll get all the speckled cows because they're few in number. But God would make the, most of the cows born that year speckled so that Jacob would get more. And then so, the, so Laban would change. So now, never mind, you don't get the speckled cows, you get the striped cows. 
So that very next year, God made all the cows were born to be strapped. God was, was able to keep Laban from hurting Jacob. And listen to Jacob tells his wife, Rachel, why it was time for them to leave her father's place. Genesis 31 and 7, he says, Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled cows shall be your wages, then all the flock bore speckled. If he said thus, the streaks shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. Laban kept trying to change the rules to cheat Jacob, but God was always ahead of him. God would not let Laban harm Jacob. So you need to rest in the knowledge that the devil is trying to lay you low. You know, a lot of people feel like the world's out to get you. The world may not be out to get you, but, but Satan is, and he's trying his very best. But if you're walking with God, God would not let Satan harm you. 46 times in the Bible we find that place, but God. And each time God changes what's about to happen to bring about a different outcome. God is able to do that. But verse 4 of our text, Paul says that we were all hellbound on a fast train, but God, but God. But God stopped us and turned us around. Look at the text in verse 4, it says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Not only did God stop our stampede towards hell, he reserved our seats in heaven. He reserved us a place in heaven. Verse 5 says, he saved you from eternal death. Verse 6 says, right now Jesus is reserving your seat in heaven. And verse 7 says that God will continue demonstrating his grace towards you throughout all eternity. Praise God, hallelujah. The grace of God which saved you is the same grace which God will use to keep you. The grace of God will keep you forever, but you need faith to receive it. You need faith to receive it. And that brings us back again to verse 8. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Faith is your only input to the work of God. God says, I'll supply the grace. All I want from you is faith. All I want from you is faith. Since our salvation comes by God's grace alone, we should walk in faith so that God can continue to let grace flow into our lives. But as you walk in faith and God continues to bless you with grace, there is one thing that you need to watch out for. And I'm not talking about the devil. I'm talking about pride. When God starts to bless us too much, we get prideful and feel like we earned it ourselves. Look at the text beginning at verse 8 once again. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that now of yourself is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. Since our salvation comes by God's grace alone, we should walk in humility so that God will get the glory from our lives. We should walk humbly so that God will get the glory from our lives. God loves to let his grace flow into the lives of his children. He just wants us to tell somebody about the source of the grace. God is better to us than we let on. We keep too much of what God does for us to ourselves instead of shouting to the world about the grace and the mercy of God. Sometimes it's because we're unconscious of God's goodness. God has been blessing so much, we don't realize how God has his hand on us and he's keeping us. And sometimes we'll face a big trial and we'll pray to God for help. And then when God changes the situation so we're, we're able to escape, we declare how lucky we were at the fact that what we feared happened didn't happen. We were just lucky. That was not luck. That was the grace and the mercy of God, and you need to give God the glory. Or sometimes we do the right thing at the right time to avoid a bad situation, and then we give ourselves the credit. We'll say how smart I was to think of that way out. No, 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 that wasn't your smarts. That was the grace that God provided to show you that way out, and then God sent a memo to your mind to go his way. That's how it came to you. So we need to give God the glory for what he does. Paul tells us in verse 9 that we have nothing to boast about in the goodness that God has allowed to flow in our lives. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. It was God's grace and not anything that we did. The most fundamental, the most vital blessing that we can receive from God is eternal life. 
And there is nothing we can do to obtain it for, our, for ourselves. If God did not want to give it to us freely, there is nothing that we could offer God that would purchase it for us. Nothing at all. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We earn what sin brings to us. We earn it. But what grace brings to us is God's gift which cannot be purchased at any price, not even by good works. God does not look at our good works and declare that we are worthy of salvation. We all come up short using that kind of evaluation. What God does, he looks at Jesus' works and applies his righteousness to our shortcomings. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's called grace. And we can't buy it, and we have nothing to brag about concerning it. And James tells us that in James 4, 6. He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we need to humble ourselves before God. Give God the glory and let God's grace continue to flow in our lives. Since our salvation comes by God's grace alone, we should walk humbly with God so that God will get glory from our lives. And Jesus tells us this in Matthew 5, 16. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The plan is simple. You do good works, God gets the glory. Not your good works, you get the glory. Or not your evil works and God gets the blame. But your good works should be to the glory of God because he saved you so that you could do them. God saved you for the purpose of you doing good works. That's God's plan. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Since our salvation comes by God's grace alone, we should walk in obedience so that God's purpose will be accomplished in our lives. We should walk in obedience so that God's purpose will be accomplished in our lives. Since God has already planned for our good works before he saved us, we need to understand that our good deeds are simply acts of obedience and gratitude. It is the height of ingratitude for you to say that God has saved you and that you are God's child and then spend your days doing the deeds of the devil. That's ingratitude. In the book of Romans, Paul addresses all the great doctrines of Christianity. And Paul addressed the ungrateful heart of man in the very first chapter and, and God's response to that. In Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. When I look at all the foolish things that are being said and done in our nation today, it leaves me speechless. I don't know how to address such a bent towards evil and the justifying of evil. I don't know how to, how to even say anything about that. And then I remember the words of this passage. Because they have rejected God, their thoughts have become futile, and their hearts have become darkened. The hearts are being darkened day and day, so the farther they get away from God, the farther they can understand anything about God. And that's what follows when God is dismissed from our consideration. Our minds become confused, and our hearts become darkened. And that's what we have done as a nation now. We have dismissed God. We want God to stand on the sidelines and stay out of our lives. Until we need a miracle, or until we need divine favor, we have no time for the word of God, so we push God out of the picture. But God is not mocked. We must reap what we sow. And when we step away from God, we step directly into darkness. We lose the ability to see clearly. For example, when you first walk into a movie theater, you can't see for a while until your eyes have adjusted to the lower level of light. For a while, you're blind. Now, the people who've been in there while can see you clearly because their eyes are adjusted, but you can't see them. They can see what you can't see. They can see you stumbling around going the wrong way. And that's why I walk slowly when I come into a dark room 
uh, so that I don't stumble over things that I cannot see. I remember I went to the movies a few years ago with two of my granddaughters. The Lifeway had sent me some tickets to a movie that the whole family could watch together. And that was strange enough. So I took two of my teenage daughters. And I was up front leading the way, blind as a bat. And I was about to walk down the wrong aisle when one of my granddaughters who used to work in that theater said, not that way, Grandpa. There's nothing down there. Let's go up here. When you're walking in darkness, you need someone who has been there before who knows the territory. Jesus Christ has walked through this dark world before, and he knows the way. Walking in obedience to God is the only way to avoid stumbling in the darkness of this world. God has a purpose for your life. God saved you so that you could carry out his purposes. Doing good works is simply your way of walking in obedience to the purposes of God and giving God thanks for the grace with which he has saved you. Walking in obedience to God is the only safe way to walk. The only safe way. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You will stumble as soon as you walk away from God. But as long as you're walking with God, all of your stumbling blocks become stepping stones. Everything that would trip you up, God uses that to lift you up. God takes care of that. Knowing that, we, knowing that God is taking care of us should cause us as children of God to rejoice. Just the thought should give us a measure of rejoicing. Knowing that God has called you for his plan and his purpose should cause you to rejoice. Because knowing that God has a purpose means that nothing will arise in your life that can prevent you from carrying out God's purpose as long as you walk in obedience to him. Knowing that God has a purpose means that God is able to walk you through every obstacle that will prevent you from achieving his purpose. Knowing that God has a purpose for your life means that God already has a solution for everything that you're going to encounter in this life. As one writer put, earth has no problems that heaven cannot solve. Since our salvation comes by God's grace alone, we should walk in obedience so that God's purpose will be accomplished in our lives. That's what we should do. And now we return to the question with which we started. How do we walk so that our lives thank God for his grace? Our very lives should be thankful to God. Well, we need to recall the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 16. And he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we can let our light shine by walking in faith so that God's grace can continue in our lives. We can let our light shine by walking in humility so that God can get the glory from our lives. We can let our light shine by walking in obedience so that God's purposes may be fulfilled in our lives. I'm going to let my light shine by walking in faith so that the grace of God has to, for me will continue to carry me from step to step, from one place to the next place so that God can use me to do his will. I don't want to hold up anything that God has for me. I'm going to let my light shine by walking humbly before my God so that all of the glory goes to God. I don't want to steal anything because God's glory did everything. I'm going to let my light shine by walking in obedience to God through the power of the Holy Spirit so that God's purpose will be fulfilled in my life. I don't want to fall short on anything that God has planned for me. I'm going to walk in grace and thank God for my salvation. I'm going to walk in God's grace and thank him for my healing. I'm going to walk in God's grace and thank him for my strength. I'm going to walk in God's grace and thank him for my family and loved ones. I'm going to walk in God's grace and thank him for guiding my feet. I'm going to walk in God's grace and thank him for directing my path. I'm going to walk in God's grace and thank him for saving my soul. I'm going to walk in God's grace and thank him for his boundless mercy. I'm going to walk in God's love and thank him for his amazing grace. That's what I'm going to do. What about you? What about you? Let's stand as the choir leads us in song.